It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question this morning is to the, uh, the Premier. Uh, and it's pretty simple. Canadians are finally going to have some progress on things that are important to them. Families who couldn't afford dental care uh, are now going to be able to do so, starting with children, this year. That's pretty great. People are skipping their meds. Uh, we know that that's the case in Ontario. Some folks are having their uh, meds, cutting them in half to be able to afford their prescriptions. Uh, those folks are going to get a break on the ability to pay for the prescriptions that they need to stay well. The federal NDP, as you know, Speaker, led the way, and we support their plan. Why? Because it helps people afford the dental care and the prescription drugs that they need. The Premier is on the record, Speaker, quite clearly opposing pharmacare and dental care. Will he now get on board with the other Premiers and the federal government to implement this plan to help Ontarians, to help make Ontarians' lives better, to help them pay for prescription drugs, to help them pay for the dental care they so desperately need? And to apply, the government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Oh, look, uh, Mr. Speaker, since uh, progressive Conservative uh, government brought in public health care in, uh, in the 1960s, we've ensured that it has improved. Uh, every single time that we've been in government, of course, we'll uh, pay attention and we'll uh, uh, see what uh, the federal government has, uh, has to offer. But, of course, we would not sign anything that isn't in the best interest of the taxpayer of the province of Ontario. And the supplementary question? <laughs> Sounds like the way this government's handled the child care deal, Speaker, and that's not good news for Ontarians. But look, these plans will make a real difference in people's lives. They will make a real difference in the health and well-being of Ontarians. This Premier has never, ever supported a national pharmacare plan. And in fact, in 2008, when he took government, he made big cuts to pharmacare. He made big cuts to, change, to Ontario's pharmacare plan that really affected especially young people, young people who suddenly couldn't afford their inhalers for their asthma anymore. That's, that's the record of this Premier. So I'm going to ask very straightforwardly, will this Premier commit to doing what is right for Ontarians, to side with Ontarians, to help them stay healthier, to help them afford their prescription drugs? Will he do that? The government house leader. Again, Speaker, of course, that is what we've done right from the beginning since we came to office, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but I tell you what we're not going to do is we're not going to allow the progress, growth and prosperity that we've seen since 2018 be jeopardized by a coalition government between the NDP and the Liberals, Mr. Speaker. Of course we're not going to do that. We're going to respect the voters of the province of Ontario, and we're going to continue to provide the excellent leadership that we have had, leadership that has seen this province grow, the economy grow, Mr. Speaker, that has seen billions of dollars invested in health and long-term care, that has seen transit and transportation being built across the province of Ontario. That is what we're going to continue to do, Mr. Speaker, because that is what's in the best interest of the province of Ontario. We'll let the NDP and Liberals try to figure out how they can combine and do coalitions. Now, we've seen Colleagues, we've seen what coalition governments between the Liberals and NDP have meant to the people of the province of Ontario before. Billions of dollars of debt, out of control uh, hydro rates, red tape and regulation and jobs fleeing the province like never before. The people of the province of Ontario aren't going to let that happen again, I can tell you that. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, notwithstanding the way that, uh, that uh, the House Leader of the Governing Party has, uh, uh, has decided to talk about this, the, the, the fact of the matter is, this is a plan that is going to be good for Ontarians. It will help provinces across our country deal with things like the hiring of more doctors and nurses. It will help to expand mental health services and supports available to Ontarians and Canadians, which is exactly what we need, especially right now. And it will help provinces to invest in better home care, better community care. Yesterday, the Minister of Home Care and Long-Term Care uh, criticized the plan. He's doing it again today. And the Premier, we know, is opposed to things like pharmacare. He cut it here in Ontario. He's opposed to dental care. He's, uh, the, he's cut pharmacare, as I said. He cut $330 million out of mental health. And then he complains that there's not enough money for health care for Ontarians coming to the, from the federal government. Question. These are big cuts and bad choices that this Ford government has already made in the last four years. So can the Premier and his minister explain to the people of this province why they oppose a deal that will help people with their health care, help people with their dental care, their prescription drugs? Why don't they think Ontarians deserve to affordably obtain those things? 
Gentleman House Leader. Uh, unless I'm mistaken, there is no actual deal in front of the provinces with respect to the things that she talks about. And that's just like the NDP. They'll sign a deal before they've actually even seen it, Mr. Speaker. But we shouldn't be surprised, Mr. Speaker. We shouldn't be surprised. This is the same NDP that is now looking to form a coalition with the Liberals. You can just imagine, Speaker, can you? I can just see it here. The Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Liberal Party, sitting around the illegal pool that the Leader of the Liberal Party <laughs> built in conservation lands in his backyard. Sipping a pina colada, the leader of the Liberal Party saying, I didn't know you liked pina coladas. The two of them thinking about, look at the success that we had in the past. $78 billion worth of debt they accumulated the first time, $140 billion of debt they accumulated the second time. Hundreds of thousands of jobs fled the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, but all of that changed when the people of the province of Ontario elected a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority government. And I believe on June the 2nd, they'll turn their backs on a coalition of the tax, spend, and tax and return a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority Fine. government. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. What it shouldn't be is all about uh, this, uh, this uh, member and his uh, crowing. What it should be about is Ontarians. What is important to Ontarians? What do they need to help make life better? What are their, what are their important values? That need to be uh, addressed. You know, Ontarians. Uh, uh, the second question, of Speaker, is to the uh, to the Premier, uh, and it's pretty clear that our province needs to step up and start taking some leadership when it comes to uh, electric vehicles in this province. We have to start addressing climate change, uh, and we know Order. that, of course. This, this government uh, has a very dismal record in that regard. He cut the rebate for EV vehicles. Uh, he ripped out charging stations. He eliminated the incentive for people, uh, everyday people, uh, to uh, be able to afford to install chargers. He's dragged us backwards for four years when it comes to climate change. By all measures, he doesn't actually want to have regular working people in this province afford to have an electric vehicle. They're on their own. My question is, why is the Premier refusing to help everyday working people be able to be a part of the transition and afford an electric vehicle in our province? Government House Leader. Speaker, now, now we're seeing it, right? Now we're seeing the coalition working together because that's the same question that the former Premier asked two days ago. And I tell you what we're not going to do is we're not going to pick a small subset of the, of the Ontario economy and say, here's five, 6000 bucks so you can go buy an expensive $100,000 Tesla. What we're going to do instead, Speaker, wait for it, is we're going to put in place the environment where people want to actually build and manufacture those vehicles right here in the province of Ontario. So as opposed to closing down automotive manufacturing in the province of Ontario, people are investing in the province of Ontario, bringing back hundreds of thousands of jobs. Millions of people are supported by the decisions that we have made that have brought back manufacturing to the province of Ontario. And just last week, the Minister of Northern Development and Mines brought in a critical mineral strategy, Mr. Speaker, which will help us Thoughts? develop batteries, Mr. Speaker. And I suggest that during question period, the leader might want to take a moment to leave and take a look at the announcement that's coming. An enormous announcement for the people of the province of Ontario. More progress on our way to increase prosperity. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, uh, this governing party might think that the people who deserve to own electric vehicles are their friends, the, their buddies who have the money, but I think that the working people of this province should not be dismissed as a small subset, but be acknowledged as the people that drive our economy, that drive our province, and make it a great place to live and work. And you can build as many cars as you want, but if regular working people Order. can't afford them, they're not going to be able to buy them. Look, Quebec has outsold Ontario in electric vehicle sales uh, for the last three years, each and every year, in the number of vehicles sold, even though we have 70 per cent higher of a population, because this government made bad choices and wrong decisions. BC, with a third of the population, outsold us year, uh, the year after the Premier ditched the incentive. So it's pretty clear uh, that this government made uh, the wrong choice. Regular working folks need to be able to afford electric vehicles. That's who I'm worried about. Not the rich folks, not the folks that are the buddies of the Premier. People deserve to have money put back in their pocket, Speaker, because let's Question. face it, gasoline prices are really, really high. 
Let's help our whole province tackle climate change and give everybody an opportunity to be part of the solution. Why does this Premier stubbornly refuse to offer EV incentives to regular Ontarians, to regular everyday working people, so they can afford these vehicles? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I mean, there's so much in that question. She talks about high energy prices, but she supports a $200 carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. How will that impact the very same people who she wants to buy EVs, Mr. Speaker? How does it impact the people when we were seeing Ford leaving, we were seeing GM close down, we were seeing Chrysler say that Ontario was the most expensive jurisdiction to do business, and there was no point in making investments? Order. Why? Because of the policies that they supported in the previous Liberal government when they were in coalition together between 2011 and 2014. Now, that changed in 2018 when a strong, progressive, conservative majority government was elected. And what did we do? We ended the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, lowering energy prices. We got rid of the red tape and regulation that was stifling innovation and manufacturing that saw 300,000 jobs leave. They came back, Mr. Speaker. We put the investments in place and the economy in place Boss? so that GM could come back, so that Ford would continue to manufacture, so that Honda would continue to manufacture. And in just 20 short minutes, Mr. Speaker, one of the largest investments in new technology and electric vehicle manufacturing will take place. And I suggest the leader leave and watch that great announcement for the people of the province. Thank you. The final supplementary. <laughs> Well, we all know what ended when this Ford government got elected, Speaker. What ended was electric vehicle charging stations in Ontario. What ended is electric vehicle rebates so people could actually afford to make the choice to transition to an electric vehicle. What ended is the little bit of help that was available to people to be able to put a, a, a charging capacity into their own home, Speaker. That's what ended in the province of Ontario. But it doesn't have to be this way. Let's Order. support every Ontarian to be able to afford an electric vehicle. We can actually get that done. It would make my life more affordable for drivers. It would tackle the climate change crisis that faces us. It would bolster our auto manufacturing. It would create great jobs in this province. Look, the U.S. has got a $15,000 incentive uh, that they're looking at right now for electric vehicle purchases. The smart thing to do is for Ontario to put an uh, a, 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 a incentive in place that will equal or uh, or in increase that incentive. So I guess the question pretty clearly is, why is this Premier refusing to do the smart thing, the right thing, the thing that helps everyday working people transition to electric vehicles by providing an incentive? Let's see it in the budget that's coming up. Let's take a look. They built charging stations at GO train stations, right? This is how smart they are. Now, a fast charger 20 minutes and your vehicle is charged. But somebody who goes and parks at a GO train station in the morning and stays there for nine hours a day, who has his char vehicle charged in 20 minutes, they felt that that was the right spot for a charging station. So what did the Minister of Energy decide to do? He decided, hey, why don't I put them in the on-ramps where people actually exit to fuel up? That makes, seems to make sense. That's what he did. More people having access, eliminating the fear of having an electric vehicle. Now, the incentives that they put in place, she can talk about it all she likes, were for the richest people in the province of Ontario. It wasn't for the poorer people, it wasn't for the people who are barely getting by, barely Spons? getting by because of the policies that they supported with them. What we're doing is building a strong economy, hundreds of thousands of jobs coming back. Those auto workers who were laid off or who were out of work are now back in their facilities, building the next generation of vehicles for generations to come, and everybody will be able to afford a queue. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Northern Ontario Health Travel Grant continues to be a major issue in my riding. It's an issue across the north, and people are not happy. We have rising prices across this province, especially at the pump. In Atacocan today, uh, people would like to know that gas is $2 a litre, $1.92 in, in Thunder Bay. And I spoke with a constituent who makes regular trips to Manitoba to obtain specialist care. She's been doing this for years. Margaret says that that trip now costs her 30% more, and all the other costs associated with travel are up. Yet the travel grant rates remain the same. Premier, when is this government going to raise the rates 
for the Northern Health Travel Grant. Good health. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. We recognize that many residents of Northern Ontario face unique health care realities compared to people living in other regions of the province, sometimes need to go out of province to receive care. And so the Northern Ontario Travel Grant Program is continuously undergoing quality improvement to make sure that it can respond to the needs of people living in the north. The 2021-22 allocation for the Northern Ontario Travel Grant was $48.2 million. And I would like to indicate that in the 2021 fiscal year, the Ministry of Health received and processed 143,495 applications and 138,000 and change. 96.2 percent of the applications were approved, 95 percent within 30 business days. I know that there was a concern previously about timing in terms of receiving the, uh, the grants back. We have uh, increased to 95 percent in 30 business days, so we are responding to the needs of Northern Ontarians. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, again, to the Premier, people can't afford to wait for this government to do the right thing. People are suffering. This is something I hear all the time from my constituents. And as I said, the, the rising cost of living is putting pressure on everyone. The people that need to travel for medical care are struggling. Many of them are on disability, especially when they have to pay up front, they have to wait for their reimbursement, and then it doesn't cover the costs. It's putting people into debt, and others just can't afford to get the health care they need. Everyone in this province has the right to get health care they need, whether they live in Thunder Bay, Atacokan, or Toronto. When is this government going to fix the travel grant? When will Northern Ontario get equal access to health care? Well, I can certainly agree with the member that people in Northern Ontario deserve equal access to health care that everyone else in Ontario receives. That's why we're continu continuously upgrading the Northern uh, Ontario Travel Grant to make sure that it does respond to the needs of people. And uh, In November 2020, the program introduced a revised application form that allows clients the option to provide banking information to receive approved program payments by direct deposit. This is certainly a great improvement on what used to happen in the past where people had to wait for long periods of time in order to receive reimbursement. And this is especially helpful for repeat users of the program and will eliminate the wait to receive a check by mail. So it is crucial to point out that check payments remain still a payment for uh, Northern Ontario Travel Grant, grant uh, patients, but we are continuously working to make sure that the program can respond Response. to the needs of patients in the quickest possible way so that they can receive the health services that they need and deserve. Good answer. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray, one sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the great MPP for Pickering Uxbridge and the Minister of Finance. Minister, there are credit unions all across my riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound, and as the minister would know, these are especially important solution, institutions to so many rural interns and small businesses in the agriculture, tourism, and hospitality sectors all across Ontario. As the government looks towards long term economic recovery and prosperity, it is important that Ontario's financial institutions remain resilient and innovative. So, Speaker, through you, could the Minister of Finance please tell us how the government and his ministry plan to support and grow a healthy, strong, and competitive credit union sector? To reply, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Yeah. Yeah. A round of applause. That's great. My colleague uh, is completely right. Uh, credit unions provide important financial services to many Ontarians and are vital to so many uh, of Ontario's small businesses, Mr. Speaker. That's why we have revised the 1994 Credit Union Case Popular Act to address outdated red tape, reduce costs and burden for the sector, and, cre and increase choice for clients. What a concept. After comprehensive research and, and, uh, of national and international standards and extensive consultation with the industry, we are certain that Ontario's credit unions have a framework that fosters growth, are consumer-focused, and are safe and sound so that credit unions can better serve their members and constituents. Mr. Speaker, our government is always looking for ways to help keep more money in the pockets of hardworking Ontarians 
Ontarians and ensures small businesses have access to safe, modern, and diverse financial services close to home. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response and his great work to steward and foster all of our finances in our province. It's great to hear that this government has modernized the Credit Unions and Case Populaire Act with these much needed changes. After 15 years of liberal mismanagement, it's good to be part of a government that is working for the taxpayer in so many ways. With so much going, ongoing economic uncertainty and the pressure that so many insurance are under with inflation and rising costs, insurance wants some certainty as to what to expect. So through you, Speaker, could the minister give us some more detail on these changes to credit unions and just how these changes fit into the government's plan to build Ontario and keep money in the pockets of Ontarians? Mr. Finance. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Colleagues, my, my, my uh, colleague uh, is right. Ontarians have faced a tough couple of years from the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic effects. Our government understands that. That is why these changes to modernize and provide credit unions an opportunity to expand services, such as some insurance products, makes uh, Ontario's credit unions more innovative, more competitive, and most importantly, allows them to better serve Ontario and their communities. Mr. Speaker, all of this is part of our plan to build Ontario and keep more money in the pockets of hardworking Ontarians. That's why we're increasing the minimum wage to $15. It's why 760,000 workers uh, are getting a raise. We've eliminated the, uh, the license plate fees, and we've removed, in my uh, region of Durham, the expensive and unfair uh, tolls on Highway 412 and 418, as put on by your leader, <laughs> Mr. My, 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 uh, your leader over there, as well, we're working on addressing many other things for the hardworking people of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government's cuts to education and its failure to support our schools has created a mental health and staffing crisis within our education system. The Thames Valley District School Board estimates that student mental health needs are four times greater now than before the pandemic, at a time when People for Education reports that the majority of Ontario schools do not have the resources to address those needs. Mental health leaves for Thames Valley teachers and education workers are also skyrocketing, increasing 44 per cent over the last year. Speaker, why is this government ignoring the mental health needs of both students and education workers in Ontario? Member for Niagara West and Parliamentary Assistant. Thanks uh, to the member opposite for the question, and I wish to also acknowledge that uh, mental health is an important issue to each and every member in this House, and it's an important issue to each and every person in the province of Ontario. It's one of the areas that I believe there's a, a nonpartisan consensus on ensuring that we're working together to improve the mental health of the province and respond to the needs of students and of every Ontarian alike, as well as the needs of, of course, our staff. And so I want to speak a little bit about uh, some of the investments that the government has made in mental health health, but specifically that the Ministry of Education under the leadership of Premier Ford and Minister Lecce have ensured that they're responding to the challenges of the pandemic, because we do recognize that families, students and staff alike have gone through a lot over the past two years, and we're ensuring that we're supporting them. Some of the ways we've done that, Speaker, is by quadrupling the mental health allocations to our school boards to ensure that they have resources in each and every classroom to support students as they go about Spons. their day, and ensuring that also staff are supported, and I'll speak more about that in the supplementary. Any supplementary question? Speaker, not only are more Thames Valley staff being pushed to the breaking point, but the complexity of staff mental health needs is also increasing. That's why the Thames Valley District School Board voted last month to create a full-time staff mental health lead, and they are urging the government to provide stable annual funding to address staff mental health needs throughout the education system. Speaker, not only is this an obligation of school boards as employers, but it is essential if staff are going to be able to support students. They can't do this if they are struggling themselves. Speaker, will this government reverse the cuts and start investing in a comprehensive plan to repair the disruption, stress and damage that education workers and students have experienced over the past two years? Years. Member for Niagara West. 
Uh, my thanks to the member opposite. And to just clarify for anyone watching, uh, I want to be very clear that this government has increased the funding for mental health in our education system by 421.6 per cent since we came to office. That's and more than quadrupling uh, prior to this government's uh, investments in this area. But for many, many years, we saw the Windell Duca governments fail to take actions that were necessary. Uh, but our government has stepped forward. And some of the ways that we've done that uh, includes uh, $25 million for local priorities that supports the mental health of students. We've seen mental health funding increase by $10 million alone this year, totaling $90 million. We've invested in mental health supports to create 1,200, that's 1,200 new regulated mental health workers in school communities province-wide, with more of these critical workers, such as psychologists, physiotherapists, and of course, social workers being hired this year uh, in Ontario schools. And we're also working closely with our implementation partner, a School Mental Health Ontario, to bring a consistent evidence-based approach uh, to mental health promotion prevention and early intervention to students across all Ontario provincially funded school boards. And we're going to continue this work and appreciate the member uh, raising this important issue. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Much speaker. Now uh, my question is for the Premier. The government introduced Bill 100 as a response to the occupation of Ottawa and the blockade at Windsor. There's not much of anything in there for Ottawa. And the truth of the matter is the Premier actually had all the tools he needed to do to use to protect the citizens of Ottawa during the occupation. He just chose not to use them. So our law and order premier, well, he, he looked the other way because he wanted the occupation to be somebody else's problem, Justin Trudeau's problem, Jim Watson's problem. Here's the problem. He made it worse for the citizens and businesses of Ottawa. And it's funny we haven't seen the premier much in the last couple of months in Ottawa, but that's not what the question's about. They now have a $36 million tax bill for policing costs, extra $36 million to the taxpayers of Ottawa. That's an extra 2% on everybody's tax bill. Now, this government shares some responsibility Question. in that tax bill. So will the government do the right thing and support the citizens of Ottawa by sharing policing costs with the federal government? Order. Government House Leader. I know that, uh, uh, again, this is something that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, addressed uh, the other day. Uh, we will uh, uh, be working closely uh, uh, with them, and I know this is something that uh, uh, the Minister, along with uh, the AMO table, will be working at uh, and looking at. I know the Minister also of, uh, of, um, uh, multi, uh, of Tourism uh, is, is also working very closely with the Mayor uh, on, the, on this particular issue. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I need to reiterate some of the elements that my colleague just mentioned here. So, if the government is claiming that Bill 100 is meant to restore business confidence after blockade, then I'm telling you that it does nothing to restore Ottawa business confidences uh, in the ability of this government to have their back. In fact, this bill does nothing in response to the occupation that happened in Ottawa, and it does nothing to indicate that the government cares if it happens again. The response of the government for the occupation in Ottawa has been delayed and insufficient. The funding support has been delayed and insufficient. And now we have a legislation that clearly says to the businesses and residents of Ottawa that they're on their own. We have been calling and are once again calling on the government to provide more funding support to the business and workers and to the City of Ottawa and to commit to an open and transparent review of the Ministry of the Solicitor General's and Ontario government's response Question. to the Ontario uh, to the occupation. Will the Premier do that? To reply, Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. Happy to uh, respond. You know, Bill 100 is all about ensuring that Ontario and the trading partners that Ontario actively uh, participates with have confidence that when our businesses are impacted through illegal blockades, uh, we're going to be able to do something quickly about it. You know, it speaks to how much trade goes back and forth between um, our number one trading partner, of course, the United States. Uh, the Ambassador Bridge in uh, Windsor is a very clear example. I just spoke to um, Mayor Dilkins on uh, Monday about this very issue. We need to have processes and, frankly, legislation 
in effect, that are going to be able to ensure that our police officers, when they need to, can act quickly. I can't speak highly enough about the Response. cooperation that occurred between the RCMP, the OPP, the municipal police forces across Ontario who stepped up and reacted and responded to uh, remove these illegal occupations. But Safely. in hindsight, we now have legislation that will allow them to react even faster. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, for far too long, municipalities across the province have not received the financial support they need to address their vital infrastructure backlog. This is especially true in large parts of northern Ontario. Ontario's small, rural, and northern communities are at the forefront of our efforts to build Ontario for the future, and many of them are facing an infrastructure deficit due to the lack of action from the previous government. Government support is highly important to maintain the health, safety, and well-being of northern and rural communities, and it is crucial as we continue to focus on our commitment to building Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through you, what is the government doing to support the infrastructure needs of municipalities in my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka? And to respond, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you so much to the very hardworking member. In our fall economic statement, our government committed to increasing funding to our small, rural, and northern municipalities through the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund. Through this fund, Ontario's municipalities are seeing a net increase of $1 billion to $2 billion over the next five years to support infrastructure projects like roads, bridges, water, and wastewater systems. This is the largest increase to OSIF since its creation. As part of our OSIF commitment, more than 19 communities in parts of northeastern Ontario, including the town of Perry Sound and the township of Sigwin, will see over $4.4 million to support local projects and will provide 30,000 residents with a safe and reliable infrastructure that they deserve. Through these investments, Mr. Speaker, we are protecting the quality of life of all Ontarians. The supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. It's great to be part of a government that is committed to supporting and building Ontario. And I'll add to that Minister's list. I know there's significant investment in the Pool Wellness Centre in Perry Sound and also the Seguin uh, Perry Sound Airport are two big projects that the government is supporting. For years, Northern Ontario was ignored and neglected by the previous government when it came to investments in public infrastructure. In fact, it was the same government that shut down critical infrastructure in the north when it, they decided that it was a great idea to close the Ontario Northland passenger rail and sell Ontario at a mere $61 million loss. Mr. Speaker, through you, would the Minister of Infrastructure please explain what other initiatives our government is taking to support key infrastructure projects across northern Ontario? Minister of Infrastructure. Again, thank you to the very hardworking member for the question. Our government is devoted to building Northern Ontario. We're taking significant measures to ensure the health, safety, and well-being of our Northern residents. One of the ways we're doing this is by investing in the redevelopment construction of a new hospital to serve the Winnebago Area Health Authority. This project will better serve the six communities of Ottawa Piscat, Fort Albany, Kasheshuan, Moose Factory, and Paywana by providing them with a new hospital, an elder care lodge, visitor hostel, accommodations, and a new ambulatory care centre. Additionally, as the members know, our government has put forward legislation, if passed, will cut red tape and ensure all Ontarians are connected to reliable high-speed internet service. I want all Northern Ontarians to know that this government, Spons? under Premier Ford's leadership, has their backs. Next question, member for Kiwetanon. Uh, speaker. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Projects like the proposed uh, Ring of Fire will have a, an, an unchangeable impact on the ways of life for um, the people that live across the north, especially indigenous people. Done right, this has the potential for economic opportunity for First Nations. But let's be honest, Ontario is rushing environmental assessments in the area and will be the major beneficiary if 
and when the roads and the mines are built. Speaker, First Nations that have concerns about the Ring of Fire and want more cautious approach are not being heard. Will Ontario ensure that development in Treaty 9 territories happen with free, prior, and informed consent with all First Nations affected? Thank you. To respond, the Minister of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. In a significant departure from what's actually happening on the ground, in fact, we have two Indigenous communities leading the environmental assessment processes for the Corridor to Prosperity, Mr. Speaker. We understand that there's more communities that might be interested in this. We don't actually build mines, Mr. Speaker. We put those communities in that region in the best position possible to make decisions for what that region could be. The potential, as the member finally has alluded to, uh, holds for tremendous economic prosperity uh, done right. We're incredibly encouraged by the signals from the new company, Wailu, uh, that has acquired a considerable stake in that region. But we're going to focus, Mr. Speaker, on the kind of legacy infrastructure that the communities is, have asked for, a corridor to prosperity, Mr. Speaker, that improves access to health and, and, and other service programming, Mr. Speaker, an opportunity to fortify broadband access to those communities and enhance the conditions under the, which those communities live in in the future, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, very few members of this government have visited Flying First Nations and Treaty 9, Treaty 5, and Kiwetnuk since forming government. But those who are familiar with the North, the far North, and who come from there know what that families and neighboring communities, First Nations, uh, neighboring First Nations have close ties and relationships that go back to time before colonization. Speaker, governments divide interests of all the time to get the outcomes that they seek. What we're talking about here is colonialism in action. Those methods do not have, do, have not worked for hundreds of years, and we cannot keep using them and expect a different result. Why is this government Question. dividing First Nations and families by forcing the road proponent communities to carry out the Crown's burden of consultation for the EAs in the Ring of Fire area? Mr. Northern Development. The, the short answer is, Mr. Speaker, that the communities ask to. Okay, uh, but I want to thank my colleagues who have made trips up into the north, uh, especially the isolated communities. Obviously, COVID pre present, prevented us from visiting as many as we uh, would like, Mr. Speaker. But here is another important truth and reality that's shared not just by municipalities across northern Ontario, but Indigenous communities as well. They want in, Mr. Speaker, on the probably the single biggest environmental policy ever advanced by any jurisdiction in the world. How do we know? Well, the co-leader of the NDP Liberal Coalition over there was just talking about electric be uh, vehicles and electric batteries as Ontario's next opportunity. And we agree, Mr. Speaker. That's why we want to make sure that from Response? exploration to electric engines, Indigenous communities and municipalities across the great northern Ontario can be counted on, Mr. Speaker, for one of the best economic and environmental opportunities this province has ever seen. Sure. Again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Through you, my question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, two years ago, just before the pandemic, uh, my staff requested a meeting with the Ministry of Health officials, along with myself and the Doctor of Podiatry. During the pandemic, we recognized that there was much going on in the ministry. There were lockdowns, hospital backups, vaccine rollouts, staff shortages, but now we have re-requested this meeting. Now that things are opening back up. Minister, due to a 30-year-old piece of legislation, no new podiatrists are allowed to register and practice in Ontario. No other health profession has ever been restricted in this way. It's discriminatory. It makes no sense. Every year in Ontario, 
Approximately 1,200 people have a major lower limb amputation from complications of vascular disease and or diabetes, with an annual direct health care cost of approximately $70 to $105 million. Diabetes are on the rise. Question. Amputations are on the rise. Health care costs are on the rise. So, Minister, will you meet with the health segment uh, in this particular area and over the next few weeks, either in person or virtually? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank you very much to the member for the question. Uh, I understand that there are concerns that there aren't enough podiatrists in the province of Ontario. However, I believe it is a question of semantics because, first of all, chiropodists and podiatrists are the only recognized and registered foot specialists in Ontario, and the main difference between the two is where they were trained and educated. Chiropodists represent the largest number of foot specialists in Ontario, and currently there are 600 chiropodists and 60 podiatrists in Ontario. Practitioners in the U.S. or those who came to Ontario before 1993 are referred to as podiatrists, while those who came after 1993 or who are educated in Ontario are called chiropodists. So I believe that whatever you call them, chiropodists or podiatrists, there are over 660 of them in the province of Ontario, and they are serving Ontarians very well. Can you supplement me? Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to you, uh, through the, to the Minister. Uh, respectfully, Minister, you've been in government for since 2018, and back in the spring of 2011, you were quoted as stating that the current uh, podiatric cap makes no sense, and you supported its removal. Uh, with an aging population, the need for this to be addressed is becoming more urgent. Successful implementation of organized integrated lower limb preservation efforts have shown reductions of up to 85 percent in amputation rates, saving millions in health care dollars. So let's provide standard, standardized best practice lower limb saving care to patients and communities. Close to 60 percent of podiatrist patients feel that this lack of podiatry, uh, uh, these, pa these people are over 80 or sorry, over 55 years of age. We are in a crisis. So Ontario has the lowest Question. ratio of podiatrists to population compared to anyone else in the developed world. Soon, we will not be able to find a podiatrist. Minister, you can fix it now. Will you agree to a meeting no later than April 14? I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Health. Well, I would suggest to the member opposite that there is no crisis, that there is no significant problem, because we already have both chiropodists and podiatrists are qualified to provide these specialized foot treatments. And while we aren't accepting any more podiatrists because we stopped in 1993, we are still graduating chiropodists who are eminently qualified to perform the work that you have suggested. We have over 600 in Ontario right now, and we're continuing to qualify people as chiropodists. They are equally as qualified as podiatrists, and that is what we're doing in the, in the province of Ontario to make sure that the people who require these foot treatments, whether it's due to diabetes or something else, are going to be cared for by a qualified professional. Next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Speaker, agriculture is the backbone industry in our great province that financially supports about one in ten jobs. It has a long history as an economic driver in my riding of Brantford Brant, which is home to over 163,000 acres of rich agricultural farmland. I recently visited Maple Point Farms, a family-owned farm, and to Heather Bootsma and her father Paul. It was a great visit, and it's using vertical farming to grow microgreens all year round. And I have to say, you can purchase them at the incredible Brantford Farmers Market. A 21st century agri-food sector needs a government that invests in new technology to strengthen and grow our province's robust food system. Would the minister please tell us how she is helping farmers and food processors Question. in my riding adopt new technologies to grow their operations, strengthen our food supply chain, expand to new markets, and create new jobs in Ontario? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant for that important question. More importantly, his incredible support for farmers and our, our rural communities in his riding. And 
Speaker, he's absolutely right. Innovation is absolutely the key to building opportunities in Ontario's agri-food sector. And you know, just recently, as I've been out and about across Ontario, I attended the Ontario Association of Agricultural Societies (AGM), and I was taken by one of their seminars. It was titled "Old Ways Will Not Open New Doors." And how appropriate is that? Because it's exactly that kind of thinking that's going to help grow our rural communities and, most importantly, strengthen Ontario's agri-food industry. And it's through programs like Ontario's Agritech Innovation Program, investing $22 million in over 170 projects across this project or province that will enable our farmers and our food processors to continue to innovate and open new doors. The supplementary question. Speaker, it is so refreshing that we have a provincial government that is in tune to the realities of, of farming and food processing in the province of Ontario. That $22 million program is going to benefit farms in my riding, like Cherry Produce in Oakland, who is using this to support the support to invest in a robotic hoeing machine. And to Cindy Toda of Toda Farms, a fourth-generation ginseng farm who will be modernizing their irrigation system to increase efficiency and output. These farms are family-owned businesses that have been oper in operation for over 50 years, and this funding will help them modernize so that they can be successful for the next 50 years. Speaker, I am sure they and other farmers in my riding are eager to know more. So, back to the minister. Could she please tell us more about this investment and the projects being funded across the province through the Agritech Innovation Program? Thank you. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I'm very pleased to be able to go across this province and listen to the people who are leading by example. And through the leadership of Premier Ford and our entire government, we're investing in the agri-food industry like we've never seen before in 10, 15 or more years. And the most important part is we're enabling farmers and food processors alike to innovate. And the agri the Agritech Innovation Program will enable um, standalone assembly lines. It will, it will enable more efficiencies and better data management. And that is what's going to drive our agri-food sector forward for years to come. And I can tell you that, you know, it, we're saying yes. We are saying yes to innovation. We are saying yes to presenting the right tools and the Response. right programs that our farmers can use to grow our sector. And most importantly, Premier, we're building this agri-food sector so consumers have confidence in Ontario growing agri-food products. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. One of the very first acts of this government in 2018 was to slash a much-needed raise to ODSP and OW rates in half. In four years, they have never raised them. We have watched homelessness soar. We have seen food and housing costs rise through the roof, exacerbated by two years of a pandemic. The Daily Bread Food Bank reports that food bank use rose by 53 per cent from 2014 to 2020, much of that driven by insufficient disability support. I know because I have been on the street and in encampments speaking to housing workers and unhoused Ontarians that a great many of the newly unhoused people live with a disability. This is on this government's shoulders. When is the government going to raise social assistance rates and ensure that people living with a disability can afford to actually live? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that question. Uh, I'd like to clarify, first of all, when our government came to office in our first year, we raised the rates for ODSP and OW to make sure that we address this issue. It is something the Liberal government had a chance to do and waited until it was going to lose the election to raise the rates. We delivered on that promise. We delivered on $1 billion in social services relief. We, we have delivered on $8.3 billion annually in supporting ODSP and OW, and our government is committed to helping people 
who have lost their job or who are unable to work. They have access to the discretionary benefit. They have access to the temporary emergency uh, support. They have access to our food banks. And we have, uh, a trillium, we have the uh, Ontario Trillium Foundation to provide grants to help eligible nonprofit organizations, including Response. food banks, $83 million. The ODSP and OW are simply one part of a multi-ministry across government approach to this sense. issue. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, that is an absolutely outrageous, silver spoon, out of touch answer. People are literally dying of hypothermia on the streets in one of the richest cities in the world. Skyrocketing rents mean that working people, as well as people living with a disability, are being forced to choose between keeping a roof over their heads and eating, and often they're losing that roof over their heads. Many are black, indigenous, and other people are co of color. Many live with a disability. Food banks and crumbs are not a long-term solution. Livable social assistance supports are a solution. A livable $20 minimum wage is a solution. Rent control and fixing the financialization of housing that underlies the rent evictions and constant rent hikes, those are solutions. When is the government going to put in place policies and solutions, systemic change that ensures that all Ontarians can stay housed and afford to eat? Mr. Children's Minister of Social Services. Thank you, government. And, uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Thank you to the opposite, member opposite. Our government has been looking at understanding across ministries how we address this issue. That's why we've been looking, uh, with, working with the Ministry of Education for child spaces. It's why we've been working with seniors and accessibility for, for dental care for seniors. It's why we've implemented pro programs through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to address these fundamental issues. It's why we have created the micro-credential strategy through the Ministry of uh, Labour, Training and Skills Development, $75 million over two years. It's why we've created the Roadmap to Wellness through the uh, Ministry of uh, Mental Health and Addiction through, through, through the Ministry of Health to, to improve uh, the life for these people who are suffering. And there's no question that our government needs to continue to support people when they are vulnerable, Response. when they have a time of need. And that's exactly what we're doing with the Ontario Child Benefit, with the, the CARE Tax Credit, with Order. the Lift Credit. And it is our, our vision to work with all our partners. And we Response. are asking the federal government to come to the table to, to uh, agree to their campaign. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, en janvier, Thank you, Speaker. On January, the Minister of Education was saying that the province was close to sign a deal in terms of child care. However, for this government, it was more important to fight with the federal government in terms of concluding a deal for child care instead of saving families in Ontario. And these costs are really affecting our families. When a deal is signed, will this government keep on providing proactive payment to these families, which they have never received in before? Response, Speaker, as you know, in 2018, child care system was broken when we took power. However, we kept on working with the federal government to obtain and to sign a deal that will be in the best interest for the province of Ontario. We're just not going to sign a deal that is not in the best interest of the people of the province of Ontario. We want a deal uh, uh, that uh, gets us to the $10 a day child care that is uh, uh, something that families can uh, can count on for generations to come and not that is simply in the best interests of a small subset of people right now speaker we're very close we're very close but we won't sign a deal that doesn't uh, help uh, generations of parents to come that's our responsibility as government and i hope that they would help help us get to that mr speaker supplementary merci monsieur le président monsieur le président thank you speaker this government keeps on playing 
in the negotiations table. And this keeps on costing to Ontarian families. The Prime Minister, the Premier, did not give those uh, details and those financial information to the table so that they can understand what is needed. On this side of the chamber, we recognize that the families are suffering. And we will keep on providing them a repayment of $276 million. Thank you, Speaker. As I mentioned, the previous government gave us a system that was already broken. And that's the reason we want to sign a deal that will be in the best interest of the taxpayers. They left us a system that is the most expensive childcare system in Canada, Speaker. That is the record of the previous Liberal government. We don't want to continue on with that system. That is why we are working very hard to come to an agreement with the federal government. The first uh, 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 offer on the table did not meet the needs of, the, of, uh, of parents in the province of Ontario. It did not uh, uh, get us to $10 Response. a day childcare, and the Premier said that just simply was not good enough. We're working very hard, we're very close, and I think the, uh, the uh, parents in the province of Ontario can be assured that what we do is in, the best, in their best interests. Next question, member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. The vibrant city of Brampton is home to over 24,000 businesses classified as transportation and warehousing, which alone contribute about 11 per cent of the city's GDP. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the impo important role the trucking industry plays in serving the day-to-day -day needs of residents and businesses in the city of Brampton and across Ontario. Many truck drivers risked their lives to ensure that goods were delivered and supply chains were not interrupted, with little to no support from this government. Precarious working conditions, rising insurance premiums and operating costs are leaving small trucking companies unable to operate. Speaker, when will this government step up to the plate and help truckers with the support they need and start regulating the commercial auto insurance industry? And to respond, Minister Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that uh, very important question. Mr. Speaker, um, since uh, our government was elected, uh, we've been in keeping a close watch uh, to make sure insurance companies are treating Ontario uh, and ratepayers fairly, including the trucking industry. And we're very thankful to the trucking industry. You know, Mr. Speaker, they, they kept our goods moving right through the height of the pandemic. They made sure that our shelves were stocked. Uh, they crossed the borders, and that's why it was so important to take the action that our government took to, to clear that un, uh, illegal uh, blockade at the Windsor border. So a big shout-out to the people uh, of Windsor for, for doing that. Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to work with, as she knows, that the commercial insurance uh, industry is not regulated by Ontario, but we're very, keeping a very close eye, making sure that uh, our truckers continue to be able to support all of us across the province. Supplementary. Um, New Democrats have tabled several bills and motions that call on the government to step up and help owner-operators with surging inc insurance costs and the underlying driver shortage that we have here in Ontario. I've spoken with members of the transportation and trucking community, and they are concerned that the current cost of doing business is unsustainable, many indicating that they have already taken trucks off the road because of the rising insurance costs. The Premier needs to act now and help truckers, some of them who are paying over $15,000 a year in insurance costs. And as my colleague from Mashikawak, James Bay, said bluntly, and I'll quote, how much more does this government think that small trucking businesses can take? End quote. Speaker, when will the government ensure that truckers receive the supports for rising fuel costs and the insurance premiums that they are forced to pay? Mr. Fred. Mr. Speaker, again, uh, appreciate the question. And Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, as she well knows that, as I mentioned in the first uh, answer to the question, uh, it, it, commercial insurance is not regulated in Ontario, meaning that policy terms vary from insurer to insurer and between each policy. 
That said, Mr. Speaker, we've worked very closely uh, and we're pleased to see that the Insurance Bureau of Canada, IBC, and their members utilizing industry developed uh, solutions such as the Business Insurance Action Team, also known as BIAT, has uh, very, been, been very helpful to help find viable insurance solutions for small businesses in Ontario's hospitality sector and, of course, in the sector that she names. You know, the other thing that I think is really important to truckers and to families right across the province, Mr. Speaker, is having a job. Uh, many uh, the, uh, the House Leader talked about uh, job creation. Do you know, Mr. Speaker, last month Ontario created 194,000 new jobs. That's 194,000. More families who can put food on the table. The next question, the member for Durham. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Over the course of this pandemic, we have learned of the devastating consequences of delaying a cancer diagnosis and treatment by just a few weeks or months. I recently learned of a young woman in Ontario who developed metastatic breast cancer this past year. What's troubling is she has waited almost a month for approval from Ontario's Trillium Drug Program to help pay for her take-home treatments. Then after the delay to her access, she still has to pay thousands of dollars as a deductible while off on long-term disability. Can the minister explain why young adult cancer patients in Ontario face these drug access issues while those in Western Canada do not? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And, um, Thank you to the member for the question. The health and well-being of all of the people of Ontario has always been our government's primary concern, whether it's by reason of COVID, by reason of a cancer diagnosis or cardiac condition, whatever it may be. Uh, receiving a cancer diagnosis, we all know, is very stressful and concerning for people, and we know that they need to have received treatment as soon as possible and have access to the drugs that they need to help them. And the Ontario Public Drug Program does provide drugs for eligible recipients, as you will know. The Ministry of Health has established a science-based approach to making funding decisions which consider the clinical effectiveness of the drug, the safety, patient input, cost-effectiveness, affordability, and effects on other health services. So I can advise that take-home cancer drugs are funded through the Ontario Drug Benefit Spons? Program, and the Ontario Drug Benefit recipients pay the usual cost-sharing amount as per any drug benefit program claims of up to $2 or $6.11 per eligible prescription and any deductible payment. So our goal is to make sure that people receive affordable cancer drugs as quickly as possible so that hopefully they can return to full recovery. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The